Well, here we go, day one. My voice is a little quiet because Kenji's sleeping. It's 5.30 in the morning. And I'm gonna start my day one vlog for Booktubeathon, but <laughs> with some further changes to my Booktubeathon TBR. I did the page 112 test last night, and uh, it was brutal. This was awful. I am not reading this, ever. It was crap, which was very disappointing. Cover buys don't always work out. And just to be doubly sure, I read one other page other than page 112. This is awful. This was not a surprise. I did not like the writing here either. I will not be reading this. Another surprise, the writing here was fine but it was the most boring, well-written page 112 of all my page 112s ever. And I looked at this a little more closely, actually read the back. This is not a Sean book. I will not be reading this. Three books off my DBR. I still have enough books, but I need... This was the one for the uh, Beautiful Spine. So I am out of Beautiful Spines. The only smaller... The only shorter books I have with Beautiful Spines, I've already read. So, I am kind of happy, but also a little bit daunted by the fact that I've gone back to Inosh Irani's The Parcel because of the length. 285 pages. I, I'll do my best, but I'm really looking forward to reading it. But And it has a gorgeous page 112. So, there is going to be an anticlimactic page 112 tag video coming down the pipe in a few weeks. Now you already know <laughs> the result of that one. And let's get started, shall we? Well, too much reading this morning. I got uh, one minute to get to the bus stop and I'm not a fast walker, but uh, I think I can make it. If I don't, if I miss it, I got a 10 minute wait, which means I can chat to you quite a bit. But anyway, the uh, making sense of Japanese is making sense. I'm mostly reading about the particles wa and ga, which are very difficult for English speakers to master. The limited Japanese I have to speak on a daily basis, I don't use subject grammatical subjects. I just missed it. That was it. Bye bye. Okay, well, I have time now. <laughs> Fuck. Ugh. So, this sentence is supposed to say, What a lot of tasty dishes you're serving us today. Honbon wa oishimono ga takusan arimasu ne. But uh, the, the writer, Jay Rubin, said, one of his colleagues said it at a dinner party. And the marker, the topic marker, wa, kanban wa. Now it's confusing because kanban wa means good evening. But wa marks the topic kanban and it differentiates tonight from all other nights. So the Japanese host laughed and said, you mean I'm usually stingy on other nights? So you have to really be careful with wa, hey? <laughs> I don't know what you should say. Kanbonga? I don't know. He didn't say. The other thing that he said that I really like is to think of wa to mark your topic as having, at least in many cases, the same, the same rhetorical force as this famous Patrick Henry speech. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Wa really it means as for me, and it has that same really differentiating function that it 
but as for me, takes here, which is why the previous sentence was so rude. Hong Bon Wa, like tonight, compared to all other nights, the food is delicious. Interesting. Finally. It's a little late. Japanese yen. It wasn't 1500 yen that I got, it wasn't 50,000 yen. That would be between $15 and $500. It's a little closer to the lower amount than the upper amount. And I blame Steve Donahue and Britta Bowler for this last little Amazon shopping spree before I leave the country for 10 days. something I learned very early on. People that wear really weird hats in the summer are really nasty and you should avoid them at all costs. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? So this is the board game I customized for my classes this morning. Roll the dice, land on a discussion topic about summer and please discuss. So while they are doing that, I am not so secretly reading this, which I can't, I've only got two hands, so I think you, I think you recognize the book. I'll just show you, without really showing anybody's faces, I'll just show you what they're doing. <laughs> And if they finish, I have this. This is probably the only time I will ever walk up these stairs for this pedestrian overpass. I avoid stairs like the plague, but I thought it might be an interesting place to make a little video snippet. God knows I need the exercise. This is my street. Which I can't name. It's the train yard. I've had a great reading morning, even though I was at work. <laughs> I read quite a bit more of the Japanese language book and uh, finding it really interesting. I'll have more to say about it. I'm not going to spend too long on this hot pedestrian overpass in the sun. But just a little bit about Lord of the Flies. The William Golding narration is wonderful. And the introduction he gives in a conversational style, like he's not reading something he wrote, he's just talking to you. And then the transition into him reading the opening paragraph of the book was just marvelous. I felt like I was sitting in the living room with him. Now, I, just, I want to report a couple things he said in the introduction. One, and I had heard this quote. It's a famous... It's possibly a famous William Golding quote. And it starts out, 
where you think, what the, what's the old geezer going to say? Because it starts out, and I'm, this is a paraphrase, but it goes something like this. Women are so damn foolish to argue that they are equal to men. That's just nonsense. They are far superior to men. Now that, uh, you maybe heard that quote. I love that, and I'd forgotten about it, and so he says it in, right in my ear this morning on the bus, on this very street. But then he goes on to talk about why didn't he have, why wasn't Lord of the Flies a mix of genders? He said he wanted to avoid any kind of sexuality in the book. Well, you don't need two genders to have sexuality in the book, and I'll be interested as I reread it to see if I pick up any sexuality among these boys. And, he said, and in terms of why not women, he said, well, it's a good question. It would be a very interesting story. And again, I'm para very roughly paraphrasing what he said. But he said it wouldn't be a metaphor for human civilization. It would be something far different. And he said, then that's just a fact. And he said, I'm going to get into trouble for saying that. And then he went on to say, and women are so damn foolish for wanting to be equal to men. They're far superior to men. But he said it would be a very different story. So I will let somebody smarter than me take on uh, some of the possibly problematic aspects of those comments, but moving on. I've just fallen into the audiobook. I'm going to start walking. It's really hot. Uh, I've just fallen into it and just, just the language. It's so lush. It's maybe my third time rereading it, but the last time was probably 25 or 30 years ago. And uh, it's just the gorgeous prose and I remember the story so well it's just like kind of coming home I think it's gonna be a very successful reread and the fact that William Golding's reading it to me in my ear it's just wonderful that's all for now all right this is the last part of my wrap-up and I'm still playing with the lighting in my living room I haven't quite figured it out maybe I kind of like this lighting we'll see what it looks like once I, once I edit it, but I love the lighting in the bedroom, but for some reason Kenji wanted to air out the bedroom, so he's got the air conditioner off and the patio door open, so I'm not going to be filming in there today. Ah, <sighs> what a day. What a fabulous day, actually, reading-wise. I just finished this book. It was a four-star read. I really enjoyed it. It didn't make me instantaneously fluent in Japanese like I was hoping but it gave me lots of good tips and it's a short very clearly explained guide to making sense of Japanese that I will refer to for the rest of my life here in Japan I'm sure and really well written with humor and very clear explanations I liked it a lot one of the things that, and again, Jay Rubin is Murakami's translator as well as other. I think he does other translation, not just Murakami. But he's also a, a Japanese teacher. And he makes a big deal in this book about the fact that it's a mistake to translate Japanese sentences which appear not to have a subject into passive constructions in English. So I'm not going to go into the weeds here. But he says, in 99% of the cases, there's a zero pronoun or a zero subject, which you need to reinsert when you translate. But, And he uses as a really sobering example, the inscription on the monument in Hiroshima to the victims of the atomic bomb. And it is, I, I'm not a great pronouncer of Nihongo, but not bad. I don't know some of these words, but I would say, Yasoraku ni namute kurusai. Ayamichi wa kurakai shimasenu kara. Most English translations of that are, Rest in peace for the mistake will not be repeated. When in fact, the correct, the correct translation of the Japanese, it's not a passive sentence, it's will be repeated. The mistake will be re will not the mistake will not be repeated. That's a passive sentence. That's not correct. It should be rest in peace. For blah blah blah, will not repeat the mistake. 
it's a zero pronoun. He keeps calling it a zero pronoun, but it's there grammatically. It's impl it's implied, and so then the question becomes, who will not repeat it? Japan for starting the war, the Pacific War, or America for dropping the bomb? That is left open to question, but somebody is responsible, and somebody will not do it again. Just interesting, eh? Not beyond language, it's just a larger implication of active versus passive sentences. The grammar geek in me was just had a hard on for this book. I would never say such things, but I think Jay Rubin is entitled to voice his own opinion. He says kanji is so stupid and should just be abolished. I don't have an opinion. I was shocked that he he's, he only gives half a page to kanji and he says kanji is ridiculous and there's only a few sounds in Japanese. If you just get rid of the stupid kanji, it would be such an easy language to learn. Wow, okay, interesting. Maybe that's all. That's enough. This is quite a long vlog. Really enjoyed that. I'm loving Lord of the Flies. And I've listened to about a fifth of it, so I'll easily finish it over the span of the booktubeathon. And I'm going to post the day one vlog now. And if I have any time or energy left over, I'm going to get a start on this. Anash Irani's The Parcel. As I said at the beginning of the day, I, was, I bumped it because I thought it was too long. But it's the only beautiful spine that's past the page 112 test. So, and I, I know I, I just have a pretty pretty strong feeling you're gonna love it. Page 112 was stunning. So, I have a good feeling about it. So I will be talking about this tomorrow. And I'm also tomorrow's plan is to read Donald Ryan's new novel. I keep forgetting the name. From a low and quiet sea, I believe. I made kind of a joke that nobody caught. When I mentioned it in my amended TBR, I was saying, yeah, it's been in the news lately. I can't remember why, but if, yes, of course I know why. I'm just de-emphasizing that literary phenomenon on my channel, tongue-in-cheek. So you don't need to point it out to me. I'm well aware of why everybody's talking about it and reading it. I adore Matthew Sharapa, and our literary tastes are so opposite that I... After I didn't watch his review because I'd like to read the book first, but I watched enough to know that it was a thumbs down, maybe even a bail. So if he didn't like it, I probably will. We'll see. Anyway, it's been a fabulous day one. And that's all. More tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a great day because my morning class is canceled. So that means I don't start working until 2 p.m. So I'm going to read my tits off. Or something. See you tomorrow.